Welcome back, kings and queens, to another chapter of Said Said, where we give you the tools to cut off the branches and dig up the root. As always, if this is your first time watching, thank you for tuning in. I hope that you stay connected and enjoy today's message. All right. So, uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much uh, for uh, our lives. We thank you so much for bringing us to this point in our lives. We know that we're all going through some things. We're all hoping for some things. We're all standing in faith for some things. But today we just uh, come to a place of stillness. We come to a place of peace, a place of, uh, we come to a sanctuary to where we can hear you. We, our hearts are open to you and we're ready to receive uh, the message that you have for us. Holy Spirit, come into the room. Uh, keep anyone safe if they're listening to this while they're on the road, uh, wherever they're at. Uh, keep them safe where they're going and um, just allow us to receive what you have for us today and to see it in a new light. And for it to be able to help us in our in our walk and for it to be a tool that gets us closer to you and furthers us in our life. So we love you, Father. We thank you for your hand on our lives. Thank you for breathing in our direction. And in Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. So today, uh, today's message is about uh, tearing off the roof. So the the scripture that I'm going off of today is going to be on the book of Mark, chapter two, starting with verse three. So if you want to pull it up on your phone or if you want to uh, pull out your, your Bible, I'm always reading out of the New King James Bible, so my version may be a little bit different than yours. So again, on Mark 2, chapter 3, sorry, on Mark chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So to just set the stage for you of what's going on in this part of Mark, is that these four brothers, these four men are taking a paralytic person and a paralytic by definition means, first meaning is affected with or characterized by paralysis or two, relating to causing or resembling paralysis. So it doesn't technically have to be someone who is actually paralyzed. It could be someone who is characterized by paralysis. So we'll go read chapter, uh, sorry, verse three again. It says, then they came to him, meaning Jesus. They came to him, capital H, to him is Jesus, bringing a par paralytic man who was carried by four men. And when they could not near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So what's going on right now is that you have these four men and they're trying to bring their friend, their paralytic friend who cannot move, who cannot walk, to Jesus. They're hearing about this guy who's healing people. They're hearing about this guy who's doing things. They hear that he's going to be at this home and they're trying to get their friend who's paralyzed to be healed, to be touched, to be in the presence of and to meet Jesus. But they can't get to him. And the reason why they can't get to him is because they're, the room of where he's at is filled all the way to the door. Everyone around him on the outside, this place is just packed, filled with people surrounding Jesus. But these men have it in their heart and desire to come and heal their paralyzed friend. Four men carrying, I mean, a lot of us, think about the nearest friend that you have and probably how heavy he is. Just think about that. And when you're paralyzed, that's body weight, dead body weight, not moving, not nothing. That's very heavy. And God knows where they came from, but they're carrying this man to him. And they have a mission in their heart. <clears throat> so on verse four, it says, and when they could not come near him being Jesus, because it says it's a capital H, anytime you see a capital H with him in it, it's talking about Jesus. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So think about it. These guys are climbing up on top of the roof with this paralyzed man. Like the ambition, the determination, and the will that these guys have for their friend is like unmatched. They're willing to do everything. Most friends would think, oh man, it's crowded, too much going on, turn around, <laughs> let's go home, bro, we'll get it another day. But these guys are like, no, today is the day. We are going to take him, we're going to do by any means necessary, we are going to get this man healed. Because they have so much faith and belief of who Jesus and what Jesus can do for this man, for their friend. And it says, so, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, 
he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, something that I want you to catch is on verse five, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. So it was not because of the paralytic's faith. It was because of their faith, the friend's faith on why he's going to heal this man. And this is why prayer is such a huge thing when we pray for others, because some people, the paralytic, like I said, when you read it by definition of what a paralytic is, either they are affected with uh, paralyzation, meaning they cannot move, or they're characterized by paralysis. So someone you know, it may as well be that they are paralyzed. So how many people, if you could think in your life right now, how many people are spiritually paralyzed? How many people don't know Christ or don't have such a strong relationship with Christ? They're spiritually paralyzed. And when you go to at night or in your morning or in your time of prayer time, you are literally in prayer, picking up that person and handing them and laying them down through that roof for Jesus to heal them. And how hard is it sometimes for us to pray for those who have wronged us, those who, um, who just have done hurtful things to us in our lives. I've had, um, I'm still working through some things where I have some people that I need to reach out to, to tell them like, Hey man, look for me and I'm doing it for me. Hey, I forgive for, please forgive me for the way that I acted back then in the day for what I said to you. Um, and, and I do it a lot through prayer, but it's because it's, it's a, it's a very much a testing point. Like these men, these four guys didn't have to help out their paralyzed friend. They didn't have to go and tear off this roof, so to speak. They didn't have to break through this roof. They didn't have to climb and pick him up all the way through. They did not have to do that. But what they did do though, is that they knew about Jesus. They knew his goodness and they knew he could do it. So by, by their faith, they were able to go through these extremities to get a healing for their friend. And if you go try to tear any type of roof off, especially back then, I mean, come on, bro. Like it's, it's a lot of process. It's a lot of digging. Not only got this guy on the roof, but you're like trying to tear it apart, tear a hole big enough for him. And then you're laying him down. I mean, if you took any friend, put him on a laying on a bed and try to lay him down. I mean, this is a lot of work that they're going through just to get this healing for this friend. So if you go to a verse in the same exact chapter, chapter two, verse 11, it says that I say to you, Jesus says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. In verse 12, it says immediately he arose, meaning the guy who was paralyzed, took up his bed and went to the presence of all of them so that all were amazed and glorified, uh, glorified, uh, sorry, all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. And that's like in that story right there, how many people do you know don't know Jesus? How many people do you know who, if they came to Jesus, people would be like, that girl, that guy came to Jesus? Are you kidding me? He don't do this no more. He don't do that no more. I mean, look at the scripture. The scripture says that the guy got up, walked, he got his bed. He went out in the presence of all of them, so in front of everybody, and all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And that's amazing. I mean, how how often does that happen today where, you know, you hear somebody turns their life around, including myself. There's so many people today, when they meet me, they think, man, said, you've been like this your whole entire life. It's like, bro, no, not at all. Like, only by the graces of Jesus and God was I able to even be half of the man that I'm, like, becoming. You know, it, it, actually all of it, not even half. It's all of the man I'm becoming. It's it's me. And a lot of it, though, has to do with. Um, let's see. Um, what I want to say is that it's our job as followers of Jesus to help those that are paralyzed. So. What I'm trying to say is, is that. When we follow Jesus, Jesus forgives us of our sins and forgives us of everything. He's always given us constant grace. He never holds anything against you. He's always in a constant state of love. What he's asking you to do, though, is to accept responsibility, take up your cross, meaning take up all the bad things you've ever done, all the wrongs, all the wrong thoughts, all the things you've ever said, meaning be accountable, 
right? Be accountable for everything and walk your walk. Take your cross and, and go walk. And um, the way that we do this, the way that you help out a paralyzed person, because most people, obviously, like how many people do we know who are literally paralyzed, right? By, by legs. And it's why Jesus and God and scripture is so good, because when you think of it in that sense of a paralyzed person, it's like, well, it can go over your head. Like, no, that's just a paralyzed person. Like, how does that relate to me and my world? Well, when you really look into it, it's, it's in a relation of people who are resembling paralyzation. And so us as followers, our job is to embody and act as Jesus Christ, to give forgiveness. Somebody wrongs you, forgive them. And, and, you're, and through that forgiveness, they're able to turn, change and turn their life and more or less get up from their paralyzation of their crippling mind that's holding them back in their life through your walk, through your release, through your freedom. They'll be able to see that and that frees them up in their, uh, in their world and their whatever it is that's crippling them. So, so what does it mean to, to help? You know, how does it, what does it mean to stand in the gap for someone? And it's mostly what we're talking about today is standing in the gap tearing the roof off for somebody. If you look around at the people in your life, someone somewhere needs you. Someone somewhere, especially if you have accepted Jesus and you're following with them, they need you. They need that, that goodness. Because otherwise, if you don't have Jesus in your life, you have the world trying to deal with your problems and everything. And God knows like that's just no place to be at. So standing in the gap means, and tearing the roof off of today's title means to do what these four men did, have the faith of them to be able to continuously always be fighting for your family member, for that coworker that you can't stand, that you bicker with, try resolving the issue by showing them grace, showing them love. They know your pattern, so switch up the pattern. Same thing with family. If you always have that one family member that you're getting into it with try a different approach try the approach of jesus because that pattern is going to throw them off of their autopilot and it's going to make them start their paralyzation that they're stuck in it's going to it's going to switch them up so stand in the gap for someone um you know like it's just i've had plenty of friends stand in the gap for me and standing in the gap doesn't mean that you have to help out somebody financially Standing in the gap could be the biggest thing that you could do for somebody is pray for them. Like that's the most intimate thing that you can do because intimacy, there is intimacy in prayer because you're really having to get beyond the surface level of their situation. And most of the time what you do is, is you ask them, Hey, what are you going? Like, if you don't mind me asking, what are you going through? Or what can I pray for you for? Or can I pray for you? Not a lot of people turn down a prayer, whether they're believers or not believers. Most people don't turn down a prayer and whatever it is that they say, obviously through the Holy Spirit, you're going to pray for them and that is going to release them and their paralyzation. And prayer is one thing. A listening ear is another thing. Sometimes some people don't want to, they want to just be able to release how they feel. And in this moment of listening to them, you don't correct them. You don't correct them. You don't uh, tell them to watch their mouth. You don't do anything. You let them blow off steam. You let them be normal. Let them be human. Because there may you may be the only person who they can actually talk to that needs that release, that safe space, that space of like, man, I'm just gonna let it all out. And unless they ask for interjection, unless they ask for advice, you just listen. And I promise sometimes in that, that will help. Standing in the gap also means, and tearing the roof off of someone also means, if your friend comes to you with a problem, the worst thing that you can do is go invite them to go to a bar. The worst thing that you can do is invite them to come over and smoke some weed or go smoke to go do drugs or to go to, for some men listening, go to a strip club and then go drink if they're dealing with issues. If you know what they're dealing with and you're helping them, you're not standing in the gap. You're really digging a hole for them even further. So standing in the gap, tearing the roof off for someone means tearing apart. Like I said in the beginning, we cut off branches here and we dig up them roots. You're actually growing a horrible garden by taking them to go drink. You're, they're running from their problems. They're, they're not helping them. So if you know their situation because you're close to this person, staying in the gap or tearing the roof off for someone can look like inviting them to church, 
And if you know they have something against church, more or less just being their friend and being around them and being a good example. Don't be a bad example to your to that friend. Um, another one could be inviting them to a men's group, inviting them to a woman's group, inviting them out to a park, inviting them out to somewhere outside, let go running to go exercise. Something that gets their mind in a positive manner. That's what tearing the roof off for somebody means. That's what standing in the gap is. Because obviously they've been doing the same pattern of dealing with their issues, mostly with drinking, gossiping, talking down on a coworker, talking down on a family member, victimizing themselves. And none of that has helped. They've ran themselves and they're running themselves in a circle. They're like a dog trying to chase their tail, thinking they're doing something. And a thousand percent, they're not. They're just exhausting themselves. So if you can get them, so to speak, with that example, to stop chasing themselves and just chill for a second, be at peace, get you out your their pattern, out their comfort zone. You don't have to like, I've invited a lot of people to the men's group. I've invited a lot of people to church and s sometimes they don't come and sometimes they won't go. Sometimes it takes time and sometimes just let them be on their own. And what this comes down to is don't save a drowning person. This is my last point that I'll save you with is don't save a drowning person. I looked it up before I came in here just to make sure, cause I've heard this saying before and it's so good, but I looked it up and it actually helped me out even further on why not to save a drowning person. And actually what do people do when you do go to save them? The reason why you don't go save a drowning person, there's actually a term for it. It's called A V I R, which is aquatic, victim instead of rescuer syndrome or avir syndrome I had no idea so what i always say don't save a drowning person and what that means is that when you have a victim out there in the water trying to they're drowning right they're they're drowning they're kicking they're treading they're trying to stay up they don't whether they know how to swim or not if the waves think about it if the ways of life if the ways of everything is over them and they're drowning and they're trying to ask for that lifeline and you being the closest person to them, you're trying to help. You're trying to be a good friend. Most of the time, and some of y'all may be in this situation where you are thinking that you're being a friend and you're helping someone out in the storms of their life and really y'all are both drowning together. And so what it is, is uh, what the term don't save a drowning person means is that when a rescuer goes to save a victim who is drowning, most of the time, the person who's going to rescue that victim actually ends up drowning because what happens is, is the drowning person grabs them, holds them and restrains them by their arms because they're just trying to use anything they can to keep themselves from drowning. They're trying to keep above water. They're freaking out. They're panicking. They don't know what to do. They just want to stay up and you're the next closest thing. This is why lifeguards I read right now. This is why lifeguards have that flotation device on them. This is why they throw it out because they give that to you to hold on to. Because otherwise, the only thing that they can grab onto is you, the being who's out there. So what I recommend is in this spiritual life, when someone's going through it, especially if you're walking with Jesus, instead of going and giving them financial help or things like that, lend them a prayer. That's your flotation device to throw at them if they're drowning. Lend them a, uh, an encouraging word. If they're saying, I'm a I'm a I, I, I hate this job. This job's horrible. Was that job paying you? Yes. Are your bills paid? Yes. Well, at the moment, while, while in this moment, your bills are being paid and you're getting paid, life could be a lot worse. How about we go and look for another job? How about we start applying while we're still going to this? Lend them a different perspective. You don't necessarily have to go get them out of their situation. So in that same example, Start looking at your flotation devices that you can give out to people. Prayer, a smile, a listening ear. Um, just come over and watch some TV. Let's go to the park. Let's go. Just something that is not going to physically hurt you. And most of the time, and we all know, especially if you've been saved, when that person gets to the last point of breath where they truly are going to drown, Jesus will never let them drown. Ever. Your job is to send them out a lifeline. It's up to them whether they want to grab that lifeline or not. And most of the time, some people don't even want to grab that lifeline. They think it means nothing and it's not helping them. Most of the time when you're giving somebody money or you're giving someone, yeah, pretty much most of the time it's money because we always know it. Someone's always asking for help with finances or whatever. 
most of the time, and I know because I'm speaking from experience, bro, I used to tell my dad, hey, dad, and I, if he sees this, I'm sorry, dad, but you knew. I'd ask him for money and I would go spend weed. Uh, I would go buy weed. I'd go buy drugs. I was asking for the lifeline. I needed help. And I'd come up with this great story. And then I knew he was going to give me money and I, I would add a little bit extra to that so I can get some more for just in case purposes to go eat or something. Just straight finessing. And because if someone's not walking with Jesus and you, and if they are walking with Jesus and they fell off, well, then you know the job to help them out. But if someone is a non-believer and they're not walking with Jesus, most of the time, the worst thing that you can do is literally help them out financially. Like it is almost the worst. They're going to figure it out. They've been figuring it out. They're not drowned enough yet. You know, like they, a lot of people have a lot of fight in them. I had a lot of fight in me and there's still things in my life that I'm still fighting a lot for, still not willing to surrender to Jesus for that I'm always revealing every single day. Oh, I got to surrender that. I, I see where I'm fighting to keep that afloat. So don't save a drowning person and be aware. Like you can help someone out, just send them that flotation device. So my challenge to you this week is to go tear the roof off for someone. Not literally like having to f fully like engage into their life and their business, but go tear the roof off for them. You have one person in your life, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your child, whether it be your friend, um, maybe it could be a long lost friend that you need to reach out to. Maybe it's someone that you need to ask forgiveness for. And remember when you ask, forgiveness is the biggest way to release most things in life. That's the biggest and most difficult thing for a lot of people, including myself, is forgiveness. Because why do you want to forgive somebody who hurt you, bro? I got a laundry list of reasons on why I don't need to forgive you. Like, we all do. A thousand percent. And that I'm going to tell you right now, that other person, they have a whole laundry list of reasons that are probably valid against why they won't forgive you or accept your, forgive, uh, your forgiveful plea. Like, it goes both ways. But that's doing nothing for either of you. You're, ba ba you're basically both holding on to like a knife and saying, no, nah, I'm not going to let go while it's literally cutting you deep. It's the most ridiculous thing. So maybe a way to tear the roof off for somebody. And it's going to feel like you're <laughs> literally picking this paralyzed person up to this roof and tearing it off to type that message or give that phone call to for ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness, remember, is always for yourself. It's never for the other person. It's up to them, though, on what they do with that, if it's going to release them or not. But most, almost every single time when you go to ask for forgiveness or say, hey, you know, I hope that you forgive me for whatever the situation was, that right there is standing in the gap very much for somebody, being there for them. And it takes a big person to ask for some things like that. So uh, my challenge to you this week, is definitely pick someone, find someone that you can stand in the gap for. If you are standing in the gap for somebody at this very moment, I encourage you to keep doing it. Keep standing in the gap. Be healthy for that person because you may be the only healthy person that they have in their life right now. That's keeping them quote unquote afloat. The only thing that I ask you to do is to do a self check on am I giving him a flotation or her a flotation device like helping them stay afloat or am I literally the person that they're using to stay afloat? Are they pushing me under with them? That's the only thing I recommend if you are standing in the gap for somebody right now. Ask yourself that question. And uh, and if you are staying in the gap, but you are giving them the flotation device, keep doing it. it I, and I pray that y'all have a breakthrough come. And I pray that Jesus shows his hand and, and God shows his hand in your life and that that what you've been praying on comes to fruition. And, and it will just keep the fight. Like I said, tear that roof off for that person. And last two points is just to always be the example that's the best way that you can stand in the gap for somebody is to be the example no matter no matter what job position you have at your your job place no matter whether you're the youngest sibling in the house or the oldest one don't matter your age don't matter how young or old you are you are always and can always be the example to, to those around you jesus likes to use and god likes to use people who seem unlikely to use so Never underestimate yourself. You can always really help somebody out by being the example and never really not so much having to say something to someone, but someone can see your actions, see your courteous, like see you being courteous, seeing you being kind, seeing you being encouraging. That right there could literally be something that you're standing, helping you stand in the gap for somebody and tearing off their roof.
um, being nice literally to somebody could help out because they may haven't had heard a compliment in a long time. Y'all would be so surprised on how often people don't receive compliments or a, a kind gesture or just help, like from a, a verbal standpoint. It, it, we can never all hear it enough, you know. And lastly, be aware of helping people who are crying wolf uh, or not truly needing help. Send them a prayer, words of encouragement, be a listening ear, maybe offer to take them to church to a men's group or a women's group. But don't necessarily put yourself in the water with them with and let them use you to keep afloat. You got to make a change if that's the situation you're in. And all of this, maybe you are that person. Maybe you are that person. You've been listening to my shows and thank you so much for listening to these chapters. And thank you for growing together. But maybe you've yet to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, maybe you're in that water. Maybe you're drowning. Maybe you're treading water. Maybe you feel like you're you're at your last breath. I'm not sure how many of y'all seen those movies where they're in a drowning moment, but you're at that point to where you got the surface right here of whatever boat it is, and you're you're just at that last you're about to take that last little breath before you go under because you don't know what's gonna come and save you. Let this be a lifeline that I'm throwing out to you. Give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is the one who who will stick his hand out and pull you and rip you out that water to where it looks like to everyone around you, you're walking on water. You will be shocking everyone to literally the life that you will live. It will seem as though you are literally walking on water and they're going to want to walk on water too through your walk. But none of that happens without taking that first initial step of stretching out your hand and letting Jesus take over your life. So if that's you, and if you, you've yet to confess and admit and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just I'll pray with you and just repeat this prayer after me. Just close your eyes and with your heart open, you're not saying this with your mouth, you're saying this from your spirit. And that comes with the place of calmness and just, I know you got a lot going on in your life, but breathe. And just come still with your heart open and just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I've come to the end of me. I surrender my life to you. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. Make me and mold me into who you want me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you said that prayer, uh, Jesus is coming in your heart. And I feel lighter even saying it. I, I, I say it every single time I do. So um, if that's you uh, and you said that prayer, all of heaven is all the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. You're home. Welcome home. I'm proud of you. It took a lot of courage and it's probably been a long time coming. And there should be a lot of relief and there is relief. I have a men's group every single Tuesday at 630 to 830 p.m. If your job if you can't make it this week, try to ask off for next week and try to adjust your schedule to where you can make it. Uh, the women that are listening, there's also a women's group every Tuesday, same time, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. It's the same thing. It's called Unique Women. It's a beautiful class. And what I recommend, though, is if you don't come to this class, find a group throughout the week. Find somewhere where you can go that's going to lift you up, build you up, encourage you. Get into that community. We've all been in that community before where it's just, it's drinking, smoking, drugs, uh, the music that is just, it's just all keeping you literally drowning in the water. Go get into a community that has nothing but lifelines for you, that wants nothing but goodness for you, that wants to lift you up, grow you and see, just pour into you and see your cup overflow. We strengthen each other. Like I said, in, in an army, they never just send out one. It's their stack side by side, line after line. It's, 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 it's strategic. You know, like we have power whenever we're all together. So uh, thank y'all so much for watching. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, uh, we will actually, before I close out, well, let's pray. Let's wrap it up with some prayer. So uh, thank you to Heavenly Father for the message that we heard today. Father, as we go out and we stand in the gap for those, we just want to say thank you for standing in the gap for us. 
Thank you for always being there. Thank you for always loving us. Thank you for always listening to our prayers. And thank you for literally showing and answering our prayers sometimes quickly. And thank you for those prayers that you are sustaining us and, and it's taking time to answer because the revelations that you're giving us during this time cannot be bought. And we just appreciate you always working on our behalf. We thank you for saying yes to our prayers. We thank you for saying no and keeping us from some of the prayers that we think we want, but you know is not good for us. And we thank you for the, the waitful prayers, uh, the ones that you say wait on it. And we just thank you in this time of our waiting period for some of us that are waiting. And we just know that you're going to do it you're going to show out in our lives and it's all going to be to glorify you and to profess your name even more so that everyone around us can see the goodness that you bring and you truly bring into everyone's lives that you touch. And as we go and stand in the gap for people this week and we go and stand in the gap for friends, family members, and coworkers or children, we just pray that you, uh, you break those chains, that you, you tear the roof off for us. You help us out in that, in that sense, as we lower them down to you. And uh, just heal them, make them whole, and be with them hand in hand in their walk. So we love you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we love you guys. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, love yourself so that you can go love someone else. See you all next week.